Hey, hello, Reckoners, and welcome to the Top 5 Games of 2016, a la Fohamner. I'm only doing Top 5 this year instead of Top 10 because I felt like I played uh, less, a, less, a smaller number of games this year than previous years, and the games I played were longer, so I wanted to be a little more exclusive. I did still go through the extreme effort of picking out 10 games, though, so the Top 5... They'll be the top five in this video, and the five runner-ups I will put in order in the description below. But without further ado, let's get started on these top five winners. Number five. Mad Nords, probably an epic quest, was a game that the developer sent a key to me for, and uh, it completely surprised me. A couple games on this list are ones that devs sent keys to me, and there's usually a really... Um, Mysterious? I, I always go into that, you know, not expecting anything, because uh, I don't request the keys, they just come out of the blue, so I know nothing about the game. And when it's a game like Mad Nords, that, that I'm just, it's so nice to be that pleasantly surprised by the game. So, Mad Nords is a parody, satire game of the classic RPG, where you're given some epic quest, and you go on it, and you, you... In the world map, you know, you encounter random encounters, and you you fight and you level up. Um, the combat system is is nice because it involves it's not turn based. It's kind of the like Final Fantasy II um, initiative bar. So as your bar fills up or as your cooldowns finish, you can take actions. So it's all real time, and so you can like you know delay actions to react to the enemy's actions at certain times. And so it's cool and it's engaging. Uh, the downside to it is there's not a lot of variability. The act, the for the most part, every time I'm in a fight, I'm behaving the same way. So it can be a little repetitive, purely on the martial side of things. But uh, the rest of the game has a very strong sense of humor, um, and it kept the entire thing interesting and fun all the way through. It's not completely done yet. Um, there's still, I mean, the game's done, like, in the sense that the content you have played will not change. It's not like an early access game, but they are releasing more chapters. They are, you know, progressing the story, as it were. Uh, so, every game in this list is a is a done game in the sense that it's not early access, but not every game is a done game in the sense that there are, is still, like, um, free DLC, for lack of a better phrase, coming to it. This is one of those... Um, I highly recommend it if you are a big fan of the JRPG genre. It's not deep, but it's fun, and um, I think it's just it's just a good time. It, it it rewards exploring in a way that I feel like a lot of current games don't. It kind of makes the world feel more real. It's not just like linear. It's kind of like if I just go in this cave, what's going to happen? Oh, it's a full thing on here, and depending upon how I act you know, certain um, things will be different in the world. Like, did I kill this guy? Did I negotiate with him? It's It was surprising from what I perceived to be like a low-budget indie game to actually have um, a little bit of complexity to it. Number four. Spellraiser is a, I think it's a free game. I, I, I downloaded it from an indie game site um, earlier this year when I was doing that a lot more. Um, it started out as a kind of text-based command line, like dungeon crawler. So, um, it's like an arcade game where you're moving around using the arrow keys, but then every single letter key on the keyboard represents a different spell. You don't start out with all the spells. As you kill enemies, they drop essentially ammo for each spell, and they all do very different things. Like, one's like shoot an arrow, one's a homing missile, one's a landmine, one's a <coughs> teleport. There's so much variety that keeping track is insane. Um, so the, the as a game, I think it's a very cool concept and it's very fun. But what makes Spellraiser make this list? Which ma what makes Spellraiser a really cool kind of sleeper gem? Like if this was a bigger game, like it had a, more of a budget and time put into it, um, I think I don't know. It's kind of great. This the size and length it is now is very good. But my point is, it has some augmented reality elements to it. There's a puzzle and investigation aspects to it, which I think really pump it up to that next level of memorability. Uh, for me anyway, like this game stood out to me as like, yes, that is a, that is one of the games 
that I am very glad, one of the experiences I'm very glad that I was able to have this year. And so hopefully including it in this list will uh, encourage anyone who's watching to play it. It's a, it's a fairly short play, like a couple hours. Um, or you can watch my Let's Play instead, but I highly recommend you playing it. Because it's one of those things, it's like a, it's, it's not full on frog fractions, but it's kind of like, <laughs> uh, you know, once you've played it, you can't ever replay it. So that's, that's Spellraiser. It's not scary per se, but it has horror themes to it. Number three. Infra is the other game on this list that was uh, sent to me unprompted, and I was blown away by. So I don't know what I expected going into it, but it has really good graphics. Uh, the world feels completely realized. I've tried to describe this game several times to my friends since I started playing it, and it's very hard. So it's like if you ever played the Riven, the, the Riven series of games or Myst, it's kind of like that in the sense that it's a first-person puzzle game. Those games, or like The Witness, those games are open world and when you encounter a puzzle, it's very clear that here is the puzzle. You need to solve this puzzle. At least with The Witness. With um, <coughs> Riven and Mist, it's a, it's a little more ambiguous, but it's, it's pretty much what it is for the most part. In Infra, it's not open world, it's very linear, but it still feels kind of open world because the puzzles aren't as explicit. Like, you'll go into a room and the door will be locked at the end. And you'll, you know you have to get through this room somehow. But it's never like this everything... It's not like Portal, where it's like everything in this room is a piece of the puzzle. It's kind of like, oh, if I pick up this chair and, and move it over here, I can jump on it to reach this shelf and get a thing. Like, it's it just feels very organic. And for the most part, for the vast most part, that is what I really like about Infra. It does definitely backfire sometimes where finding what the puzzle is is much, much harder than solving it. Um, for example, just recently, in an episode that's coming out after this video, uh, there was a puzzle where I, I had obtained a clue that was like a door code. So it's like, oh, I have a door code. Okay, I need to find a numpad to put the door code in somewhere. And I'd also noticed something else in the world where it was like, the, the, this, this fan that's that's blocking this ladder will shut off if uh, it detects, um, you know, contaminated air. <coughs> so I'm running around trying to find this Goram numpad and I can't find it. It turns out, spoiler alert, I guess, for an episode in two days, uh, it turns out the solution was freaking to grab this boot full of glowing mushrooms and stick it under this detector. And it was frustrating because it took me an hour of chasing my own tail to figure this out and getting really frustrated and contemplating you know, breaking down and using a guide. But this, the fact that the, the way the solution ended up being just felt really... I don't know, complete in the world. Like, this is a real-world solution. It wasn't like... <laughs> it wasn't just like, solve a logic puzzle, or do a math problem. Which I do like. I like this a lot. Um, like, you'll notice in those below, one of the other runners up to this top 10 list was um, a game called Doors, which is a very short game, and it's literally just a series of, like, complete logic puzzles. Um, like, kind of the opposite of this game in a lot of ways. Um, so I like both, but... Infra just really feels dynamic. Um, also in part because there are multiple solutions to maybe not every like puzzle, but a lot of them. Like there there have definitely been many like buildings from just trying to get from point A to point B, and I have just ignored possible other solutions because there's there are multiple solutions. So I figured out one that worked. And I was like, oh, there were other clues back there, but they were for other things. Um, and again, this is a good thing and a bad thing, because later on in the game, there's a point where I navigated through a building, and I, I, I the, 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 brand, the, the path forked, and I chose the path that ended up backtracking into the building because it was actually the exit from a different solution. <laughs> so I ended up wasting time discovering this thing. But again, it makes the world feel more 
actualized. It's not just a linear puzzle path. Not completely. I mean, it, it you know, it is a little bit compared to an open world. It's not, it's not an open world game by any means, but um, it just, just being in infra is very cool. It's not a perfect game by any means. It has that clarity issue, but um, I am repeatedly kind of like just filled with a sense of satisfaction and rewardment as I progress through it. So this, to me, <coughs> is probably my favorite game on the list. It, it definitely needs polish, which is why it's number three. But I think it's very bold at what it does. And I think it's, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's incredible at how, how it pulls it off. Number two. The Warlock of Firetop Mountain. So this, is, this gives an interesting backstory to it. The developers who make this game, I met them in person at PAX Prime this year and bought the game from them there. Um, but it turns out that they do a lot of games like this. So what the Warlock of Firetop Mountain and many other games that this company do is they take old uh, like D&D choose your own adventure novels and they video gamify them. So one of the so way back early on in this channel, I think like back when I was breaking a hundred subscribers as like a reward or as a like fun little thing <laughs> for that, I had started basically doing an exhaustive let's play of of one of their other earlier choose your adventure video games. Basically, every episode of on, on my channel would have been um, between two choices, and then the player could like click a link. And it would, like, for choice A or choice B, and it would take you to the next video. And this seemed really cool, and it was really fun, and I had joy in making it. And then it kind of occurred to me that when this was done, it would more or less replace the video game. Like, there would be very little reason to buy the video game because you could just watch my channel and make the decisions yourself. Now, there were some die rolling, dice rolling elements to it, um, but I was going to, you know, have different results there too. So I ended up just scrapping the whole thing and never publishing any of it. <coughs> the Warlock of Firetop Mountain takes that same kind of concept, that same kind of game and makes it, I think, so you can't really do that. I could do an exhaustive playthrough of the Warlock of Firetop Mountain choosing every single branching path, but it would not be as complete a substitute for the gameplay experience. Uh, and the reason for that is something that really takes this game to the next level, and that is the synchronous tactical combat. So it's not turn-based combat in the sense that I take my turn and then they take their turn. Basically, you give your character a command and then it plays out at the same time as the other NPC's commands. So if there is a goblin to my right, if I think he's going to attack me, I want to attack him, that way our attacks clash and I hopefully win. If I think he's going to move, I want to try to attack where I think he's going to move to, so I hit him for free essentially. So there's a lot of extra thought into it, and this has the, has a lot of, bring thought to the table, it makes the game feel more replayable, because it's not just like clicking through the same decisions over and over again to get to a new decision. It, it, it's, it's more engaging and urgent. It makes you feel accomplished because once you've played against a creature type enough times, you've kind of learned their, their patterns and their habits. And so it feels like you're leveling up, like you've learned something and gotten, you know, more experienced and better. And, uh, because the way the combat is affected by your decisions early on, or like um, your non-combat decisions, your actual book story decisions, it really melds the game together and makes it feel like more of a video game and not merely a visual novel. It's it's just a very good package, and I still haven't explored all of the paths yet, but um, I am money well spent. It's uh, it's it's very replayable. The stories are good, the characters that you can play feel, they play very differently, and they play in a way that makes sense. Like, it feels like this character, yeah, he's like a rogue, he's, he plays like Sneaklier. This character is a rhino man, he plays aggressively. It's just really cool, and uh, I think more people should play this game. Number one. Lisa, or 
What are the other names for this game? They call it Lisa the Painful? I believe Lisa the Painful is another name for this game. Lisa the Joyful as I believe the DLC sequel, which I am including in this review. So, <clears throat> Lisa is a game that I was playing, technically started playing it back in 2015, but the bulk of my playing of it came out in 2016 after I had done my 2015 uh, best top 10 games. So that's why it's in this video. <coughs> and Lisa is a game made by a single person, and it's a it's an RPG, a turn-based like RPG, side-scrolling kind of graphics, um, loosely based off of like set in the same kind of world as the book, um, was it Children of Men? So the setting is you, the main protagonist. Your character's name is Brad. You are the custodian of a child, a female child, and since some unspecified apocalyptic event. There are basically no more females on the planet, and no, and so there's no children. There's no, um, it's, it's just all men and some mutants. So you are protecting this child from like the savages of this all man world, and so some very dark, dark tones there. And the main storyline is definitely uh, not happy times. And it'll make you, it'll force you to make some decisions, which feel a little contrived, but I think the game is immersive enough that um, they were actually hard decisions for me at the time I was playing them. Like, I actually felt like, oh, what do I do? Like, it wasn't kind of like a calculated decision. It was, it was, it was a decision in the spirit of the story. And I think that's a very hard thing to do. And this game did it well. Uh, there's definitely a couple of things that break immersion and that's largely when the the game has a strong sense of comedy and sometimes it goes a little too far and isn't really funny and breaks immersion and that's too bad but it's definitely the exception the game for the most part is funny when it's okay to be funny and serious when it's trying to be serious and there's definitely a lot of overlap in a very masterfully done way the Gameplay itself is kind of like the best. It's not like groundbreaking, but it's it's the <coughs> it does the best it can do for turn-based JRPG. I'm not saying turn-based JRPG is like a like oh it's the best for turn-based JRPG. I mean w one thing that I really like like from turn-based RPGs, Chrono Trigger is a good example. It's not just like here's the line of enemies, here's the line of heroes, take your turns hitting them. It's a DPS race. You have to kind of be observant and react in a way that makes sense. For example, slight spoiler alert, one of the earlier bosses, he's he's got a big hairdo. So if you notice, you can actually like hit up and target not just him, but target his hair. And his hair is vulnerable to fire damage. And so you kind of have to notice like, these sensical things. Like in Chrono Trigger, a good example would have been, um, there's, a, there's a zone where you're fighting a bunch of snakes and toads. And... The uh, toads are like invincible, like they're taking so little damage. And so the trick is to damage the snakes, which will eat the toads to heal themselves. And so it's just kind of like emergent um, world gameplay that I very much like. And Lisa has this kind of Dark Soulsian story delivery method. It's not quite that bad, not by a long shot, but there's all these kind of subtle background things. And very, very easy to miss things. Like, I basically, I played through Lisa, and then I went through to the wiki, and I replayed it through, like, two or three more times, just doing all the different things you could possibly do, just to try and see everything and get the full picture. And then I read the wiki, <laughs> read the rest of it, to get, um, you know, the, the community's consensus on the story. And it's just, it's so rich. It's, it's so good and so worth your time. Um, definitely stay away if you don't think you can handle inferences or threats of rape. There's never nothing, I don't think there's anything ever explicitly done on screen. It's always just kind of like implied, like a dark situation. It's definitely not graphic either. The graphics are low res, low poly. So it's not anything like gross, but conceptually the game is grim. So if you have a weak constitution, again, not insultingly, just in general, if, or you're not, you know, you don't want like a, you don't want any of that, you're not in the mood for any of that, 
stay away. But I still the game is my it's my number one game of the year. It's my number one, possibly number one JRPG right after Chrono Trigger. Um, just because the soundtrack's good, like the 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 stage, the setting, like each like set piece feels really really cool. Um. There's just so many good jokes, like the bulldozer scene. Like I, at the very least, I guess watch the watch the let's plays. I don't know. Um, I can't talk about it too much for two because I don't want to overhype it because <laughs> that's always a, a risk, right? And I don't want to spoil anything. Um, but I mean, obviously, this video is essentially me recommending games for you all to play, and this is the number one recommendation I have. Um, if this had made it in my 2015 list, it would still be number one. Like, this game is just, it's just a solid, good experience. Like, you, you'll feel, you'll laugh, you'll cry, you know, you'll kiss three bucks goodbye. It's just, I'm going to stop talking before I, you know, repeat myself and spoil it and ramble on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so thank you guys so much for watching this video. Um, good plan, good, good stuff planned for next year. A lot of good games coming up. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to another for 2017. Thank you guys, and uh, let's make it a good one. Signature catchphrase.